Ladies and gentlemen, it's six o'clock in London, it's 1 p.m. in New York. Finally, our time zones have realigned, thankfully, for the current, well, equinox towards the next solstice. It's 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, 3 a.m. in Sydney, 10 a.m. in San Francisco, and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. My name is Patrick L. Young, the IPOVID live stream series eight, episode three, that amounts to 45 shows start here. Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is Ivana Gazic. I've just got back to Europe after an incredible stay in the Caribbean, where, as you know, we were having great conversations with Chris Giancarlo, with Peter Leonardos when I was in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And before that, we were in the Bahamas with the good folks of Arawak X. We're staying with a very interesting niche exchange theme today. We're inside the Zagreb Stock Exchange. Ivana Gazic is the president of the management board of the Zagreb Stock Exchange, which is the leading developer of the capital markets in the region. And what an exciting region Southeastern Europe is. Ivana started her career in 1998 at Pleva PLC, where she worked until 2003 as head of global capital market operations, going on to work for several local banks. Since May 2010, she's been running the Zagreb Stock Exchange. She's also president of the supervisory board of the SEE Link Skopje, a legal entity founded in 2014 with the aim of establishing regional order routing services between a series of different markets, Bulgaria, Macedonia, and the Zagreb Stock Exchange. That was, of course, added to because just uh, the next year, in fact, at the end of 2015, Ivana's Zagreb Stock Exchange acquired the Ljubljana Stock Exchange where she's also president of the management, oh sorry, the supervisory board rather. Ivana is also a member of the Council of the Croatian Financial Supervisory Agency. And it's a pleasure to have her here today to talk inside the Zagreb Stock Exchange. Well, that may be a leading question to start Ivana, but where in the world are you today? Hello, Patrick. It's really nice uh, to have this conversation with you, especially since we know each other for a very long time. And you have been following Zagreb Stock Exchange for a bit now. So uh, you know that uh, we have transformed from a purely local exchange to the somewhat of a regional player, especially after we have acquired Ljubljana Stock Exchange, as just mentioned. And uh, Recently, uh, we managed to acquire 7% 7 of Skopje Stock Exchange in Maced North Macedonia. So uh, what we are trying to do is somehow uh, find the liquidity in the region and uh, uh, give opportunity to the investors of the region to get uh, acquainted with the uh, uh, shares uh, uh, of the neighboring countries. Absolutely fascinating. And you're absolutely right. We've been, well, I've been enjoying watching the journey that you've been on for the course of the last 10 years, Ivana, and a very exciting one it is too. Talk me through just for a moment, what are all of the functions within your little department store, the Zagreb Stock Exchange itself? Uh, so I would say we have four main areas uh, of work. Uh, I will start with the communications department, who is taking care of, uh, you know, PR issues, articles and so on. But also we have pretty developed uh, uh, academy where we have uh, uh, educated more than 15,000 people in these 10 years uh, of its existence. Uh, we have a shorter seminars on finance, but we are also giving public uh, uh, general knowledge to the general public about the capital markets, what trading means and so on. Uh, then uh, we have an IT department, which I would say it's a heart of our organization. I would say that exchanges are becoming more and more technical uh, organizations. And uh, we have changed quite a bit of software in these uh, 12 years uh, uh, we used to run on NASDAQ, now we are using Xetra, like many other uh, exchanges in the region. And uh, we are just now developing our own surveillance system because uh, due to unlucky uh, uh, path of our surveillance systems, uh, we had four and now we are trying to replace it uh, with the own, uh, our own solution, proprietary solution. Then we have a department in charge for the market operations and uh, uh, surveillance. Uh, 
and uh, they are actually doing uh, uh, everything connected with listing members, uh, changes uh, of the system and so on when, when we have some new listing or some change in the trading pattern and so on. And finally, there is a legal department. Uh, legal is another heart of the exchange uh, because we are, you know, heavily regulated and almost any decision uh, in the company requires the presence of lawyers. Uh, besides other things, we are also listed uh, on ourselves, so uh, for five years already. And uh, so we have a person in charge for investor relations. We have around 300 shareholders. Um, and uh, we have, of course, our daughter companies that we are managing ourselves uh, uh, on various ways. But uh, uh, domestic operations are handled from here. It's a tower in Zagreb, 22nd floor. And uh, Ljubljana is only one and a half hours away by car, although it's in a, another country. Uh, so we travel there for meetings and uh, for Macedonian trips, uh, it's a one hour flight. So uh, everything is, I would say, in the same region. Very interesting and, and quite a dynamic region, which we'll get on to in, in just a moment. So just so that everybody understands, you list uh, stocks and bonds including also your own shares. Do you own your own uh, clearing settlement depository? No, which is a not good uh, scenario for us. So unluckily, uh, uh, first to come what we are listing. So besides what you have mentioned, we also have recently listed two ETFs. And uh, they are, uh, I would say, a pretty big success in Croatia because it's very well designed for retail investors. Um, and uh, uh, regarding the clearing and settlement, neither in Croatia or Slovenia, we don't own depository and uh, uh, clearing, which I think is very bad for the exchange because uh, 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 it is much easier to plan new products and development of the market if you have both sides of the cycle, uh, how to say that, uh, 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 on your uh, supervision. So uh, in Croatia, it's state-owned. Uh, we were talking with our government uh, for num numerous uh, times uh, to privatize it. We are not really uh, sure why they didn't move on that. And in Slovenia, it's owned privately, but not uh, by the persons who are involved, who are involved by the exchange or connected to the exchange. Yes, it's it's an interesting scenario, and and obviously you're in the same position as, for example, Warsaw, because they've got two completely different companies for the stock exchange and the and the depository as well. Okay, so you're you listed. You said you've got your own stock listed. Um, talk us through that. Are there any particular shareholder limits in what I mean, open to foreigners, or percentage limits that can be acquired? Anything like that? Mm hmm. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the whole process of the self-listing, uh, we didn't find a lot of uh, descriptions of this process uh, on when we decided to do it. We did it because when we were acquiring Ljubljana, we needed capital increase and uh, we wanted to have institutional investors as part of our shareholding structure. And this is when actually EBRD became our, our shareholder. EBRD was a big advocate for the capital markets in all their countries of operations. They still, they, they still are, and they were supporting us through many uh, projects, uh, and we really wanted to have them on board. We still have a board member. Uh, he, his name is uh, Bernardo Mariano, and he is a stock exchange expert from Argentina. And he's actually travel, to, traveling to all our board meetings. And we find that uh, very useful because uh, he's acting as our advisor when, you know, we, we, we don't know something or we want to understand how other exchanges in the world are doing that and so on. Obviously, being the only exchange in the country makes your job a bit difficult because you cannot ask your colleagues uh, how to run the exchange. Um, so just to come back to the uh, uh, protection rules. Uh, I would say it's uh, very standard in Europe uh, for each threshold of the ownership and the first one being 10%, you need to have a special approval from the regulator in order to acquire. 
uh, there is no uh, limitation on anybody, but obviously they wouldn't give uh, uh, approval to somebody who is uh, um, for some particular interest trying yeah. to get a stake in the exchange. Understood. I mean, it's a, so it's a reasonable fit and proper process as opposed to there being a, a, an actual lack of permission. So as long as you are essentially upstanding, fine and reasonable, you can buy a stake in the exchange. That, yep. That's very interesting. And and so roughly what's your sort of market capitalization today in, in euros or dollars? It's, a lot, it's around 10 million euro. Okay, and that's that's yeah. a that's a number. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. good to know. For two exchanges, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, it seems to me to be uh, quite remarkably, remarkably cheap, actually, given the fact that it combines yeah. both uh, Zagreb and Ljubljana together. So, tell us a little bit about, I mean, the development of the Zagreb exchange. As I remember, there used to be a couple, or even possibly three, exchanges in Croatia. Am, is my memory serving me correctly? Yes, it actually does. Uh, there were two. Uh, mm -hmm. The other one was uh, in Varaždin, which is one city like 100 kilometers from here. And uh, basically it was created uh, as a competition uh, to Zagreb Stock Exchange. Uh, and uh, they started to compete uh, each other on the prices. And uh, shareholders were practically uh, the same. Uh, and then they sit down, uh, sat down and decided to merged the two exchanges it happened in 2007 and mm -hmm. uh, until we still have some people uh, from the old exchange working with our exchange mm, very good very interesting altogether so as things stand at the moment um how has your experience been with first of all developing zagreb over the course of the last 10 years uh well, uh, when I joined the exchange, uh, of course, uh, everybody, it was in 2010, right after the big crisis of the markets and uh, everybody was uh, still, uh, everybody had still fresh memory of the two large privatizations that happened in 2007. And people were thinking that the state might continue to privatize, which over the course of two or three years, the first two or three years when I joined, showed to be wrong because the state decided not to privatize anymore and uh, then we were just you know we were sitting and thinking what we can do to somehow uh, bring the liquidity to the market because obviously there was enough investors but there were not enough investment cases and uh, we decided first to go international to try to acquire some other exchange and then after that, uh, we also decided to build up the whole uh, 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 the whole path of financing for the companies in all stages of development. So uh, for the, the the smallest ones, so like startups and uh, very small SMEs, uh, we entered into partnership with Funderbeam from Estonia, which uh, is a, at that time it was a platform built on uh, uh, blockchain. Now they change technology, but they are still running this uh, market. And uh, we started organizing financing for these very small companies. It was considered very uh, revolutionary from the other exchanges, if I can say so. Uh, many of them were thinking about it, but I am not aware that any other exchange has entered into such a partnership. But for us, uh, it was very valuable because these small companies are growing and they basically uh, have the capacity to become larger. The second uh, platform that we started, although I have to say it's less su successful than the Thunderbeam, is Progress, which is SME growth market, one of the ideas of the Capital Markets Union. Uh, which I have to say, you know, uh, still didn't bring uh, benefits uh, to the exchanges, especially to the smaller exchanges uh, that I have uh, been expecting. And then we have regulated market. On regulated market uh, happened something which is very common for the transitional countries. And this is that we had a law which forced the companies to list. And at one moment we had 450 companies on the exchange. Uh, for comparison, Vienna has 100. Uh, so uh, in the course of the years, we had a lot of companies that were actually not ready for the exchange. So I'm not a big fan 
of uh, listing mandatory mandatory listing to the exchange in any economy if the the the, the companies don't want to come the, by themselves it doesn't really make sense uh, to force them in any way Yes, it's very interesting. I mean, certainly I noticed that the one I think was always most graphic to me was Belgrade, just down the road from from your good sales. I mean, they had 2,000 companies or something, but actually only about 14 of them ever actually did any trading, I seem to recall, about 10 years ago. Uh, it, it's an interesting concept, but it just hasn't really caught on. So, you, you've developed the capital market well. Uh, we're going to come back to some of the things you were talking about in just a second. Compare, contrast Zagreb exchange with Ljubljana, Ivana. Hmm. Uh, well, you know, uh, we as a countries are geographically and in every other sense uh, very close. So we share almost the same language and so on. But I would say uh, the countries are still very different. Uh, I would say Slovenian economy is uh, much more closed. Uh, in terms of uh, not uh, having privatized, for instance, their banking sector and many other companies. Uh, they are not very open to foreign investors. Uh, on the other hand, uh, creations uh, are a bit more uh, adventurous. And uh, what uh, I can see is that uh, creation investors are very heavily invested into Slovenian companies. But vice versa, it is not the case. So Slovenian investors are not that invested uh, in creation. Uh, and uh, the second thing, which was a really big surprise for me, was the fact that, uh, uh, so we are in the EU, obviously, and so close. But because of these uh, rules that every country can apply the laws uh, in the European Union with some space to you know, have some individual differences, actually brought us to the position that many of the laws and the way you run the exchange and run the supervisory board or, or management board and so on are really different. So uh, I sometimes have a feeling that we are living in the two very far countries, not uh, very similar being both in the EU. Isn't it interesting? You can manage to get so close and yet the EU divides you in a way that even, well, even as independent nations, you are, you are somewhat proximate. It's quite interesting that, and I think a lot of people miss that because people think that the European Union is incredibly homogeneous. And certainly the further east you get, the, the more the, the disparate divisions seem to arise. And I don't mean between people, but just between bits and pieces of laws. I mean, the technicalities of yeah. running companies. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it yeah. becomes very difficult, therefore, for example, to easily list across border, etc. I mean, that, that's something it's, which has not really been in cured. My, in my opinion, it's very, very difficult to list uh, uh, in other exchange. Because, look, uh, we would be the first ones. So Zagreb Stock Exchange would be the first one to list on the Ljubljana Stock Exchange. Because obviously for us, we, we own both exchanges. Yep. We would like foreign investors to own our shares and so on. But look, uh, we need to write prospectus again because it is not uh, in Slovene. So we need to report in one additional language. So it is not enough to report only in English. You have to report in the local language. That's, you know, only beginning. And all the other things that I wanted to uh, mention, it would take uh, some time. So uh, you really need to be incentivized in order to go to the other exchange. I don't see a point. For instance, we have two stocks from Ljubljana listed in the Poland on the Polish stock exchange on uh, their uh, MTF. And 99% of the liquidity is still in Slovenia. And uh, it is actually causing additional work to the companies uh, not giving them a lot of benefits. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting as to how that develops. And so you were on an interesting path, as you say, you've been developing this whole concept of essentially raising funding from the very lowest level, from crowdfunding all the way up, which is very interesting. I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, speaking with Ivana Gazic. We're inside the Zagreb Stock Exchange this week. I'm coming to you from a rainy Malta, which compares or contrasts with last week, where I came to you from a rainy Turks and Caicos Islands. At least the good news is it's not actually raining on me this week. So Ivana, it's very interesting what you're talking about here. Tell us a little bit. I think we got a question actually came in 
asking about what are the key lessons you learned from your Thunderbeam experience? The key lesson is that uh, somehow financing creates the possibility of the uh, growing company. Let me explain. Maybe I, I say it a little bit confusing. What I wanted to say is that there are a lot of good ideas, but only if you if you have money and investors who can help these companies, the ideas will develop into serious businesses. And the more I was thinking about Thunderbeam in Croatia, I realized why European uh, economy is not more technically and uh, technically advanced, if I can say so, because the U.S. is just offering the sort of financing that was giving first money to Thunderbeam to to Facebook to Google and so on. I cannot imagine that uh, in Europe uh, these companies would succeed starting, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago because we didn't have enough uh, funds devoted to the te technology and fast growing companies with very bold uh, and uh, very brave ideas. Uh, and uh, this is why I said, look, I will not do a lot. We cannot uh, work with uh, thousands of startups in Croatia, but if we do 50, and we help 50 ideas to become decent businesses, we have done a lot for this uh, uh, community. And uh, I have to tell you that after three years of doing that, it's very, very rewarding for us. And uh, I really see a couple of candidates uh, that will uh, in two or three years be ready for the exchange. I think that's absolutely marvelous because it's actually something that's vitally important because a lot of people have lost the real economy, financial economy linkage. And actually with what you've been achieving with Thunderbeam, it's a very, very close linkage between the two. The fact that you might even get some content that ultimately comes to the exchange is even better, but being able to facilitate fundraising is a super, super thing. We're sitting here inside the Zagreb Stock Exchange with Ivana Gazic. Ivana, like many other stock exchange leaders around the world, reads Exchange Invest every day. My newsletter published by myself, Patrick L. Young, with my ace team if you'd like to subscribe send us an email or drop us a message on social media and we'll be happy to sign you up for a free one month trial so you too can read about what the world's exchange leaders are reading week in week out every day via the internet via our newsletter now ivana so thunderbeam is here then you mentioned the fact that you built this platform so it was a CMU kind of SME fundraising platform. That doesn't sound as if it, it really has taken off to the same degree. No. Uh, well, uh, um, the idea of Capital Market Union it was to create a market that would be exactly very similar to the exchange, but just with much lower uh, reporting requirements, no prospectus and so on. Uh, but somehow we didn't catch up uh, with the companies. Uh, I think that other exchanges who are running the SME growth market, like I know that many uh, in Europe are, I don't think that we have done some monumental steps bringing so many SMEs to the exchange. So obviously the magical uh, uh, formula in order to have more listings and have smaller companies being listed is still not invented, in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because you're right. I mean, SME growth markets just have not particularly worked in Europe overall. What do you think could be done that might help improve them? Is the problem actually capital markets union itself not being big enough and broad enough across the European Union or what? I think... Uh, the tax incentives uh, in form of investment accounts, like uh, it was done in UK. Yeah. Uh, so uh, some sort of uh, tax relief for investing into SMEs for individual investors, uh, and uh, also some state fund that would match the funds, for instance, uh, raised through the exchange or some uh, through the SME growth market. So uh, I think that would that would really help. And maybe some special regime for these companies for three to five years, you know, how they are being uh, uh, treated in tax way or something like that. So uh, I don't think that just by 
saying you don't need to write uh, 500 pages. Now you need to write 100 pages. It will really incentivize the companies to go to the exchange. Yeah. No, I, I tend to agree. And given the fact that most of that 100 page or 200 pages or 300 pages is actually all this boilerplate legalese that doesn't really tell you anything about the company. I mean, that, that's one of the things I think is a fundamental problem here because it costs so much to get to the market, even for a lot of the SME growth markets, certainly in the West, that it, it becomes uneconomic for companies to really go forward and try and uh, list on those sorts of venues. Yeah, uh, definitely. I really think so. And uh, um, how to really move it forward? Uh, one additional way would be that this in, the, the advisors for the companies uh, who are taking them to the SME market are also somehow incentivized to do it because the, the exchange cannot speak to all the possible issuer in the country. We need to have some sort of sales channel and this, our sales channel are our members and our members or investment advisors need to have that uh, as a priority. Uh, it is very difficult to raise such funds in an environment where there is almost zero interest rates on loans and other. We also yeah. have EU money, which is coming uh, through many funds uh, and so on. So uh, uh, it's not easy. We are competing with cheaper money. So we need to do very good reasoning why they would come to the exchange. Yes, it's one of those it's one of those challenges in order to manage to bring bring the market together. So. Let's talk about something which has been really fascinating. You pioneered um, SEE Link. Tell yeah. us about that and how that came about. Well, I uh, remember a very good uh, one conference in Belgrade, and there was uh, it was at my beginning of my work at the exchange, maybe 2012 or something like that. And there were foreign investors on this panel and they were talking that they would invest in the region if they could have one broker in one of the countries and be able to place the orders on every uh, exchange in the region. And I thought, you know, it's a very good idea. Like, uh, we should be able to do that. And uh, there were many uh, regions that were talking about uh, connecting in that way. So uh, we got the support uh, from uh, EBRD and we built up a system uh, in which uh, uh, every exchange uh, has uh, members who have signed up for SA Link system. And if you wish to trade uh, from Zagreb uh, broker to, for instance, Belgrade, uh, he will find a counterparty broker in this country and execute the order for you. What actually happened is that uh, brokers started talking to each other and uh, we did a lot of conferences and traveled together with them to other countries and so on. And uh, what we actually uh, found out is that they have built up very good connections. Uh, they continued to trading, but they were not that much using the platform. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I understood then that the problem is not uh, that easy. When I was recently trying to buy shares in Macedonia, uh, it was a pain. You know, it's a separate language. You need to change the currency. They are treating you like a foreign investor, so you need to go through know your customer procedure that is very lengthy in every country and so on. So actually what still exists, and now I'm talking about the countries of the non-EU, but for the EU, yeah. it's pretty similar. It's pretty similar. If you're opening an account in a Slovenian bank, you do all over again like you do in Croatia. So um, uh, the investors had this uh, dream vision of the US, and the US is a totally different world because every state in US has the same currency, the same language, uh, the same papers, uh, while, and you can trade very easily. I think it will take ages until we really have that in Europe. It will be a very slow and very painful process. Yes, it really is a shame, and it's certainly not helping the developing end of, of Europe in southeastern Europe and central and eastern Europe, where there's so much opportunity for growth. But as you say, there's so much paperwork to manage to battle your way through. So. I mean, that is a fascinating pointer altogether. 
What do you see, therefore, as being the, the major areas of potential for your exchange group? Um, I think that uh, we need to uh, start, continue building our regional championship position in uh, not only the, the integration, but also always uh, being on the edge with the new trends, uh, uh, attracting new technologies, new products, new members, and so on. So uh, we are trying to be a niche player in terms of uh, exchange world in Europe, but uh, on the regional level, I'm pretty sure that uh, many smaller exchanges are actually looking up to us and saying, yeah, that there are many things that they can still do uh, in what they are doing, as well as I'm looking at the larger exchanges and uh, trying to do that uh, over here. Um, I can tell you that uh, uh, every four years I need to write a program of, for my work, uh, and that's going that's approved by the regulator. I go to the interview there, and I'm always amazed. Uh, how much the world changes in four years. So I just recently went to see my last uh, plan and uh, some of the things that happened, we didn't even foresee, you know, we didn't foresee uh, such huge impact of a crypto world to our business, uh, not only from technology point of view and the way exchanges are, you know, actually looking at how they can implement this uh, strategy or, or a technology into our work, uh, but also uh, as competitor, because uh, many of the people who were not at all considering investing are now investing into crypto assets. And they are willing to take these risks, although in exchange business, we are all about protecting minority rights and small, small investors. So the change is really, the world is changing extremely fast. And I, who says he, who, if somebody says who knows what will happen in five years, he's lying because we have no idea what will happen in five years. That's just uh, too fast pace around us. Yes, it's very interesting, the speed of change that we're seeing around us driving so much in the exchange industry. And certainly, when you look at that, and I mean, you mentioned the fact that you've used NASDAQ technology, you've Zetra nowadays from, from Deutsche Börse Group and so on, and you think about the number of interfaces that you have to clearing and settlement and so on, it's... It's incredibly complex trying to put together a modern day stock exchange. How is it for you when you're dealing with one of the smallest currencies in Europe? Is that a factor in how your exchange works? Um, yes, definitely. But uh, you're asking about our currency, like Croatian Kuna. Yes, yeah. yes Kuna, uh, yes. Yeah, it is. It is complex but look uh, it is back to euro and uh, the good news is that uh, we are in exchange mechanism and the plan is to have euro uh, as our currency 1st of january 2023 which i right. think uh, will help our business uh, from, from technology point of view it, it is not that relevant uh, it will be some work but nothing significant but definitely it will help uh, to remove this uh, foreign exchange uh, risk that we had until now mm -hmm. certainly it's one thing i suppose ought to try and attract other entrants from the rest of the european union who've got so used to the idea of getting ubiquitous euro pricing across 11 12 15 markets yeah it helps. It really helps. I mean, our economy is very dependent on tourism. We have 20% of our GDP coming from tourists. And obviously, they will be much happier when they come to the country and they can buy with their own money. So. Yes, yes. The, the facility that that's going to offer is going to be something quite significant. So what does it feel like? I mean, you've mentioned in passing and it's very interesting because you sit on the cusp of Europe inside the European Union, but yet actually you've got a lot of neighbours who are outside the European Union. Um, what is that like in terms of facilitating trade and dealing with the countries around you? Oh, it's, it's very, very uh, complicated. 
Look, uh, mm -hmm. we were just discussing, we have uh, one company in uh, Croatia, which is called Infobip, and uh, mm -hmm. they were just evaluated as unicorn, and they are thinking about listing, but they are exclusively thinking about listing in US. And mm -hmm. I get all the time questions like, oh, why they didn't list in Croatia, why they do don't double list, and so on. So the complexity of the company being listed in US and Croatia is the same like complexity of the company being listed in Croatia and Serbia. Right. So, but, but for the US company, you might be motivated to do it because it's a large company, you know, it might have a lot of investors and so on. But the question is really, is that all work worthwhile? to do uh, for, uh, for, they call it third country. In the MIFID 2, it's always yes. somebody coming from a third country. And uh, it's, uh, I, I don't think that any company, so for instance, if a Serbian company wanted to raise money in Croatia, what I would do in their place, and they would probably do it, they would start a company in Croatia and then fund from this company in Croatia, not mm -hmm. doing something. Yeah, cross-border. Yeah. Well, Sydney, it's very interesting because you look at the amount of assets in, let's call it the whole, you know, the whole Yugosphere. I mean, the former Yugoslavia. And it's intriguing how many private equity deals have been done there and how many household yeah. names have never touched the stock market. Um, I mean, you know, whether it's Bambi Biscuits or Gnaz Milos Water or all sorts of other manufacturers of soft drinks and other products. And they've never actually reached the stock market at all, being owned by increasingly obscure vehicles in faraway countries, way beyond, I mean, third countries of third countries. Uh, yeah. It's quite fascinating how that's happened. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you, but uh, there is a hope, I think, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, this, uh, fun these funds and the uh, majority of the venture capital funds and so on are still, you know, not the ones they were that were exiting through the exchange. Their, yeah. their horizon of investing is a little bit off uh, in terms of uh, how they find targets and so on. And the majority of the venture capital funds have just done their biggest investments in the region. So I think uh, the exits through the exchange will come. Um, they are dominant now in Poland or Hungary or something like that. So I think it will come to Croatia as well. Very interesting. It, it will be interesting to see when that takes place in Croatia and indeed through the region, because certainly, yes, Poland, I think, is the only place where we've kind of seen venture capital funds, private equity funds, ultimately using that as an avenue to exit their invest investments through the, the Warsaw Stock Exchange. But of course, I mean, you're in a very different country. So just run us through those numbers for those who are not aware of, uh, you know, the, the, the population of Croatia is? Around 4 million right. people. Right. Four million people, yeah. So, I mean, essentially, it's a, it's a, a very petite, pleasant, small northeastern state of the United States of America in terms of total population. And you're you're nestling in a very interesting area. You've got twenty percent of GDP, which is tourism, which I'm not surprised because you've got exquisite coastline, beautiful hinterland, <laughs> um, absolutely fantastic. And certainly, I thoroughly enjoyed going to one of your, your conferences many years ago, even when we went there in pretty much the middle, the depths of winter, if I seem to remember correctly, to, uh, to the coast. And it was absolutely magnificent. Yeah, well, the tourism uh, really did uh, favor to us uh, because uh, we are uh, the destination, car destination, and uh, this year the recovery of Croatia was much faster uh, because the tourism has really, uh, it was really strong no matter the COVID crisis. That's very interesting. So, so overall, the Croatian economy has managed to kind of weather the storm of COVID without it being quite as dramatic as it was in other places? Uh, well, it was not that dramatic like Italy or Spain, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we are in the fourth, fourth uh, wave now. Uh, but, and we have problem like many Eastern countries, Eastern European countries with the vaccination rate. Uh, however, the impact on the economy was not that bad. I just uh, heard the speech of the governor today, our governor, and he said that he expects uh, that we will reach pre-COVID level, uh, perhaps even in this uh, quarter. 
Wow. Which I think is excellent, yeah. That's fantastic. That's really, really good news altogether. And how yeah. did how did you find running your exchange? I mean, did you have a lockdown period or how did that work? It was crazy. I have to say, I will tell you, uh, if somebody told me that I will run the exchange for six weeks uh, without stepping into my office, I would say this person uh, is talking nonsense. But uh, I remember very good the last meeting before the lockdown on Friday. We said, look, uh, like I was sitting with my team and I said, well, why don't we do like exercise? And on Monday we stay home to see whether we can really run the exchange from home. And then they said, no, but on Monday we all usually have all crazy, you know, everybody's asking for something and so on. Let's do it on Tuesday. And on that Sunday, there was a recommendation from the state government that uh, everybody who can she should stay at home. And we called our people and we said, like, stay home and everything worked. And uh, then after one week, we had the ma major earthquake in Zagreb on uh, Sunday morning and uh, our network collapsed because uh, the data center of the telecom provider went to fire. And uh, after that, the whole day we were trying to find alternative ways to trade next day. So uh, it was really, really difficult here, organizationally, yeah. Gosh, an earthquake on top of COVID. I think that makes yes. you absolutely unique in the world. Yes, yes. What we we said, you know, what is the next, like the plague, plague or something like that. I, we, we, it was unbelievable. Well, fortunately, you don't have that Irish saying that these things come in threes because who knows what the next <laughs> thing could have been. <laughs> Could have been, no, we don't. Could have been. <laughs> Luckily not. <laughs> Luckily not. No, good, good, good. You only get to two yeah. and then that's it. Oh, that, that's, a, that's a relief altogether. So, I mean, where do you think that the, the opportunities lie for, for Zagreb Stock Exchange at the moment? You mentioned, for example, these ETFs. That's very interesting. Yeah. So we have first two ETFs uh, 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 and they're actually super uh, product for people who cannot... Uh, make a decision what to invest in by themselves. So they can say, I can invest in the top 10 most liquid shares on Zagreb Stock Exchange. Um, but if you say so, you need to have a lot of money because you have to buy 10 different stocks. Uh, and uh, with ETFs, with, I don't know, 20 euro, you actually invest in the whole uh, bucket of uh, these 10 uh, uh, companies. Uh, just recently, the first ETF uh, on uh, crypto was uh, approved in the US. Uh, so the, the fund can invest by basically in anything. If you want to be exposed to gold and you cannot buy a, a gold coin or, uh, or more gold, then you can buy for 20 euro or 30 euro stake in the ETF based on gold. So I think it's a very good product for retail. It's liquid because obviously it's on the uh, on the exchange and for the exchange it's very good because uh, obviously the ETFs are being traded and they then have to buy stocks in order to have these uh, uh, stocks in the fund and it's a double turnover for us. So uh, we as exchanges like ETFs, we think it's a good product. That's very interesting. And I mean, the regional market for ETFs has been relatively sparse to date. So are you hoping to, to really manage to become a, a national and then possibly also push the region in the ETF business? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, exchanges are not the one who are issuing them. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, investment fund companies, but we are lucky to have intercapital in Croatia that has pretty large uh, uh, asset management company and uh, they are thinking uh, about all the time about innovation and uh, I'm, I hope that other investment fund companies are going to uh, lead their example and list, uh, list ETFs on the exchange. Very interesting altogether. So when you look at your position, I mean, geographically, you're incredibly close to Italy. You're not that far from Vienna. There are a lot of bourses around you in terms of, you know, a couple of thousand kilometers takes you to a vast number of exchanges across the world. 
Are there any in particular that re really inspire you of the neighbors or of other exchanges around the world? Uh, well, I have to tell you that I really miss uh, the World Exchange Congresses. Uh, mm -hmm. The last one was uh, two years ago in Beirut. Yes. Uh, the beautiful Beirut, I have to say, mm -hmm. uh, at that time. And uh, I had the opportunity to speak uh, then to the colleagues from all over the world. And uh, exchanges are very individual because they are a result of the long term the history of the country they are from but uh, you know i learned a lot from oman stock exchange to the nasdaq to uh, 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 i don't know uh, my colleagues from vienna and then very dear friends from the region and so on i cannot say that there is one single exchange that we would like to become or be similar we are just trying to take the best from the world that we are open to. I love this industry because people are very open as we are not competing to each other in 99% of the cases. So whenever you ask your colleague how we can implement something or they ask us how we did something, we always share. So uh, this is why I like the industry and uh, this is why I actually like your newsletter that you mentioned because uh, I got the ideas from there as well. <laughs> so. Well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear altogether. And actually, I agree with you. That that conference in Beirut was absolutely fantastic. And fantastic. it seems like a lifetime ago now, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both in terms of COVID and what happened in Beirut. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's a tragedy what's gone on in Beirut over the yeah. course of the last... Uh, I mean, they've had precisely the opposite. There's no danger they're going to get back to their... Uh, their economy of two years ago in Q4 of this year. I mean, it's lost already something like 30%. It's, it's really, really tragic and such an yeah. amazing city. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, but then it's one of those things where I think the, the lesson I drew from being in Beirut was that all of the Uber drivers were actually local people from Beirut, which I've never seen before, because even in Warsaw, the people driving Uber are migrants from Ukraine and Belarus. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of the economy being really, really grim when you've actually ending up with the local people wanting to drive the, the low end of the taxi cab fleet. It's, uh, yeah. it's really, really sad, really sad it altogether. Is. And yet so many things going for it. Um, but, it, but yes, I agree with you. I mean, that World Exchange Congress is a great forum. And certainly, yeah, we all miss it. We're hoping that it'll be back soon. If you're watching this, mm -hmm. good folks at Terrapin, there you go. There's an introduction. <laughs> Where are we going to next? We want to know. Maybe we can go, maybe we can go to Zagreb. Maybe we can go to somewhere on the coast. Yeah, uh, sure. Sure. Uh, actually, I would recommend Dubrovnik because Dubrovnik oh. is now not overcrowded. Uh, mm -hmm. it's such a beautiful place when there, it's not overcrowded. So I think it could be a good place for the World Exchange Congress, definitely. I think D Dubrovnik sounds like a phenomenal opportunity altogether. And of course, you're the president of the supervisory board of the Ljubljana Exchange, and it's exciting at the moment because I do believe Slovenia are the presidents of the European Union. So has that been drawing you into many EU events? You, uh, you know, when COVID started, it was ours, so Croatian. Oh, uh, my goodness. Presidents. Yes. Yeah. And there was oh, that's so right. many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there were so many plans for the conferences, for, you know, visitors and so on. And nothing happened out of that. So uh, actually, Slovenia doesn't have that good uh, epidemiological situation. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have big forums. Majority of these forums is transferred to either hybrid format or dominantly online. So uh, it is not going to be like it was in other countries when there was no COVID, mm -hmm. unfortunately. That's, uh, that, that's two tragedies in one, actually, because, of course, the last time we were supposed to meet was going to be in Zagreb after, yes. after one of the... I was the European bankers, I think, I was supposed to be speaking at. Yes. And unfortunately, that got cancelled, which is such a shame. Um, I do hope things are not too bad in Slovenia, because I know that Mrs. Young is off to... Uh, the SME and the SME awards next week. So I hope that things will be okay for her trip there. Uh, uh, she should follow the news because uh, the restrictions for entering anywhere and so on are pretty uh, tough. But of course she has a COVID passport, so she can do whatever she wants, but 
some of the people who don't have it uh, have a problems. No, clearly. Well, I've got to say, actually, to be fair to the European Union, who I would criticize often, their their EU passport for COVID has actually been working remarkably well. Um, it's, yeah. it's something which is which is useful for getting across borders around the place. Um, yes, yeah, so that's going to be coming up next week, actually, which will be very, very exciting. I won't be there, unfortunately, but Beata will be there for the SME Awards hosted by FASE. Me neither, but we have a candidate uh, for the, I think, uh, rising star or fast growing star. Fantastic. Like yeah, so we are very excited to see whether they got the award. That's magnificent. But even so, to have somebody who's nominated, given how many other markets there are with huge numbers of SMEs listed from London to Euronext and NASDAQ and so on, it's absolutely marvelous to see that that's being acknowledged, Ivana. So, yeah. Ivana, I mean, here we are, we're looking at Zagreb, nation of 4 million people roughly in Croatia. You're elegantly nestling really in the heartland of a very, very <laughs> exciting piece of Europe itself. You've got a lot of growth and a lot of opportunity. I'm intrigued. I mean, where do you think, where do you think your exchange goes next? Where do you think the capital market revolution goes next? I think uh, I mentioned it a bit earlier. I think technology will totally uh, change the way we are thinking about trading today. Uh, the, cri the number of crises or incidents in the past that happened on the capital markets, like, I don't know, Lehman Brothers crisis or something like that, they just caused more and more, the more and more regulation and more and more investments into security, into providing a lot of layers between the client and the settlement and so on. And uh, I think uh, that the technology will really try to disrupt this because it became too complex, too, too expensive and too uh, uh, slow. Because if you want to like change and do something new, it takes you months and months and months. So uh, the first bigger, biggest attacker to us uh, as uh, capital markets is obviously the crypto world, because even if these people uh, uh, participate, uh, whatever happens uh, in their investment, if they lose money, if they get stolen or something like that, uh, they will see that like they have lost money in the capital markets or investment in general. So they will have even more trust into traditional exchanges. And uh, we will need to find uh, different ways uh, to enable with the technology to make it more secure, but more accessible uh, to uh, the investors. Uh, I just spoke uh, to the company that IP had IPO'd in the September on Zagreb Stock Exchange and they could not believe their IT company. They couldn't believe that people need to physically go to the broker in order to buy their shares. And on the other hand, you have like Revolut and you can buy whatever you want. So the question is, why is this so? And it will change for sure. I'm sure it will change. On that note, with a creed de coeur for seamless operations, with a desire to see that third countries are interlinked in a way that the Zagreb Stock Exchange can better facilitate trading, Ivan Gasic, who's one of the co-founders, creators of the SEE Link that brings together a series of exchanges around the region. She's chairman of the Ljubljana Stock Exchange. She's the chief executive, the president of the managing board of the Zagreb Stock Exchange. Absolutely wonderful to talk to you today, Ivana. It's been a really, really interesting, illuminating picture, how you've brought together Funderbeam and used their platform in order to facilitate crowdfunding and smaller listings. So exciting to know that you've got several possible IPOs that are going to come to market from that in the future. Lovely to see things that are all coming along in the little incubator of future public listed companies. It's been really interesting to talk about the nexus of Capital Markets Union, what's been good and what's indeed been a challenge about Capital Markets Union and the areas in which that needs to grow and come together. Technology remains a fundamental issue for us all. At the same time, while it's wonderful to be here on the wonders of LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube, being able to talk in real time about the wonderful world of markets, it is indeed a joy to be able to get out there and meet people face to face, which I know we will have a presence next week in uh, 
Slovenia for the SME Awards of FESE, which we're looking forward to. I unfortunately can't be there either. I hope your Rising Star Award comes together really well. I certainly hope that we won't have to wait until the next World Exchanges Congress before we meet again, because we have had a couple of opportunities which have been cancelled in the course of the last couple of years. Fascinating to hear about how you dealt with COVID, dealt with an earthquake. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been inside the Zagreb Stock Exchange. My name is Patrick L. Young. I want to thank my guest, Ivana Gazic. I'd like to thank my production team today, Beata, Veronica, and Marianne. This has been edition number 45 of the Cadre, which is the IPO vid live stream. We'll be back next week. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great week in life. And of course, as the executive director of Valerian Blockchain, I have to say, in blockchain and markets. Thanks for watching.